uh, Senior Society is doing at the moment, and then just talk about uh, beans and the making of. So, Emon Butler. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, my name is Eamon Butler. I'm the head of animation at Cinesight. Um, we are based in Soho, which is right in the centre of London, uh, right next to all the other big studios, MPC, Framestore, DNAG, and a lot of the smaller studios. Um, it's a very exciting environment to be in. I'm going to let this reel play. Uh, this is just a, an example of some of the work we've done over the last few years. Work has covered uh, theatrical released films like Bond, uh, John Carter, as well as broadcast work like Generation Kill, Band of Brothers, and we're very keen now to develop our skill set into uh, feature animation, which is what I'm trying to do at the moment. Um, I'm going to move forward on this because it's you've probably seen loads of reels today from everybody else, and it's all very sexy and stuff. But, um, uh, projects that we finished recently uh, include World War Z. Uh, we just finished 300 Rise of an Empire. Monuments Men we finished at the beginning of the year, which is quite nice because it's a small film, kind of a boutique film. And it's often nice to work on smaller projects right after you do big projects because they, you get a lot closer to the clients, a lot closer to your director, your vision effects supervisor, and those can be very rewarding. The bigger shows can be also rewarding but mostly because it's about hauling lots of heavy work across the finish line. Films like this are great fun to work on. Um, Jack Ryan did some very straightforward work on. We came in on the end of Robocop uh, to help out. The suit didn't work very well. Um, the physical suit that was applied to the actor wasn't put on perfectly every time, and, um, and the actor had questionable posture, uh, which made him look not as slim as he should have looked. Uh, so we had to digitally slim uh, his suit as well as add uh, mechanical inserts to uh, parts of his suit so it didn't look like a guy in a suit. Um, we recently uh, finished uh, a really nice sequence on Edge of Tomorrow. Has anybody seen this movie? So we did the training sequence where uh, he's in a, a, a shooting gallery firing at these mechanical uh, mechamimics that fly around and he gets killed a number of times. Really cool. I killed Tom Cruise like five times in this movie. <laughs> uh, we did a little bit on X-Men as well. So it's last minute came in. Uh, we had to reproduce a digital cityscape for the opening sequence of that film. And we're currently uh, wrapping up on Hercules um, and Man from Uncle, which is Guy Ritchie's next film. So that sort of gives you an overview of the type of shows uh, that Cinesite does. I joined Cinesite about a year and a half ago to uh, bring in more animation work and increase the quality of the animation work coming out of that department. And one of the first things we decided to do was 
do a short film. Uh, and the story behind that was we, we tested on film. Um, I won't say which one it was, but we did this very elaborate test that we paid for. And we didn't win that project. It went to another company. And this is sort of common practice in the industry. Um, the problem was we spent about three months on the test, spent quite a lot of money. And then we couldn't show anybody else that test to win more work. So if you're all filmmakers, what I have to do is win your work, do the work, finish the work, wait for it to come out in the cinema, then I can show that work to other directors and producers to win more work. So it's quite a long wait before I can use what I'm doing to get more work. Is everybody with me? Yeah, it's a, it's a painful process. And sometimes when you do a test to win your, your client's uh, trust, that's great. But if you don't get to work on that show, you can't use that content to show anybody else. So I thought, wow, we just really kicked ass in this test and now we can't use it to win more work. It was just for that one show. So we decided to do a short film. Alvise, who's sitting in the front here, had a great idea uh, for a short and it sort of fitted the schedule that I needed to do it in, which was about six months. Uh, I really liked the idea because we could do it on our own terms, put it out on our own terms, we didn't need anybody's permission, it would belong to us, and it would show the world what we were capable of as a studio and as artists. Um, here it is. I thought we'd spend today talking about how we made it, why we made it, and what we learned during the process of making this short film. Um, <coughs> firstly, why, why make a short film? Well, it served two, two purposes for me. Uh, one was that it allowed me to develop the company reel, which we just talked about, so it's very important that you stay up to date with current work. And I wanted to do some big creature piece that just completely fit the bill. And the second reason was to push this ourselves creatively. Now, every visual effects company is creative to some extent, but creating content from the ground up, coming up with the idea, developing the character design, and seeing it through was something that not every company does. And I wanted to develop a culture within Cinesite of coming at a problem from a, from, a, from a blank page perspective and see how we could do being creative from the very beginning. Um, and it's something that I think is very important to us going forward as we become a company that generates content. Uh, it started with this. Um, this is a book that we uh, I purchased. I think it was on Amazon. It's out of print now. It was originally published in 1999. Uh, it's called Full Moon, uh, and it's, it was published by Michael Light. It's an amazing book based on over 32,000 pictures taken from NASA archives of actual Apollo mission photographs stitched together and represented uh, as high-res photographs. It's, it's a journey to the moon and back, um, full of amazing shots. And when you open this book, you, uh, one of the first things you see is uh, an image like this. And I remember looking at it going, oh, it was kind of disappointing. This is a black and white book. But actually, it's a, it's a color photograph. And all of the pictures are color. And yet, they look completely and utterly desaturated. And it sort of sparked this idea that, okay, we really need to understand the photography, uh, you know, what it looks like to be on the moon. Because everybody's familiar with it, and we wanted our film to initially make you feel like, oh, I know what this is. This is guys on the moon. And then the idea was to turn it on its head. So you can see on the right-hand side, it's a little difficult to see on this monitor, but that um, lunar rover is gold. There's a better example of it. You can see gold on the left side, but that rock on the ground is completely grey um, and devoid of any colour whatsoever. The other thing that I noticed as we watched this was, was it always feels like nighttime on the moon, even though this is daytime. Okay, clearly it's daytime. 
but it's nighttime because it's how black the sky is and how long the shadows are and how deep those black areas are. So the photography, we, we, we brought in uh, Richard Clark, who was our CG supervisor, and he was able to dissect these images and come up with a look approach to match this. Um, we also realized um, the incredible depth, there's incredible depth of field in all of the photographs. Everything's really sharp, and any time you introduce color, the chroma really pops on these images. So that flag really has a lot of color in it. Um, the shadows, as you can see from here, are really long. All of the highlights ha have blue uh, for various reasons, which I'll get into in a minute. But we noticed the depth of field all the way to the horizon was really sharp. And that's a signal that it's very bright on the moon. It's actually, I think, close to six times brighter on the moon than it is on the Earth. Because there's no atmosphere to filter that light at all. So we started making a list of all these key visual things that we needed to replicate in our, in our rendering. Um, halation, glow, and bloom. You can see there's a glow on the white areas of the spacesuit, but equally there's a glow on the lens, and that's actually dust, lunar dust stuck to uh, a glass uh, protective panel on the front of the camera. Uh, and the dust on the moon is electrically charged and will stick to everything. And as you read about it, you realize that you know, uh, astronauts had a big problem with lunar dust sticking to their suits. So they got quite dirty very quickly on the moon. We, um, we passed off all of this imagery to uh, John David, who was our art director, and he started to come up with some sketches and paintings that encapsulated um, the look of the film. Um, so he came up with this idea, and he painted up a monster based on some of the designs that we've been working on. Um, and we kind of started to veer away from this. We'll get into the monster design earlier on, but we felt that brown looked like it belonged on the Earth. It felt like it was Earth-bound, and it didn't feel like it the creature needed to live on the moon. Even though it's not like anything you'd see on Earth, the color started to have a meaning at this point. We also wanted to make sure that we kept the saturated color on the astronauts' uh, uh, visors. It became quite a focal thing and always meant that you would look right at their faces every time they were on screen. Um, the astronaut design, uh, Elvis had, had put some uh, drawings together Based and you know he went off and had a ton of, of reference photographic reference that he pulled together of each different part of the suit taken from various sources including museums and we went to great detail to match uh, uh, the detail in the suits in our model but we ended up doing a combination of suits uh, because we we added straps to the front of the suits mainly to help sell the low gravitational pull on the moon. Without the, without the straps, it felt a little dull, but having the straps settled slowly tended to reinforce that the gravity was different on the moon. Um, one thing that became clear was the livery, which is the, the markings on the suit, uh, was quite important, actually. Every, every space mission that's ever been has had a unique patch, a unique badge on, on for each astronaut to wear. And we found out very quickly that um, the uh, astronauts like to have their names as part of that uh, badge. And Nikki, who was our texture artist, said, oh, we'll, make, we'll, we'll have our own mission badge. So she went off and, uh, and created uh, our mission badge, which looked like this. That's my name up there. And Avadi is the director's name. So he gets the top billing. Um, so that was all our crew for the front end of the production. And uh, it was great because, you know, nobody else is ever going to see that. But we know it's there, and it's kind of cool. Um, and it was really great. What was nice about working on this film was we, we had a fairly small team, as you can see by all the names here. And uh, what's nice about that is everybody can have a little bit of input, a little bit of say in helping making it special and cool and having some creative input. Um, but sometimes being creative means like my job as a producer and Elvisa's job as the director on this can be to get the best out of people but also keep make sure they're on track and there was a point during the making of this project when uh, I don't know if you remember but the monster bites a guy in half and throws him throws him into the background and as he's as he's flying away you see inside the broken bit right where his guts would be and we hadn't textured it at all it was just a black hole so it's flying away and we thought, oh, we need a texture for that. And Nikki called us over to her desk and said, look at this. And she had a website open 
with the most disgusting images I've ever seen. And she was all about reference. And uh, we're like, you can't, you can't even, I don't even want to, oh, I don't even want to look at that. And, um, and we were like, well, what do we put in there? I'm like, we can't put that in there. That's disgusting. So um, Alisa came back and he said, uh, I've got the image. So put that in there. And that's a plate of Italian deli meats, pastrami. Yeah, it's delicious. But if you squint, it's kind of gross. So it, it worked great. And that's, that's, that, that's the texture that's inside the astronaut when he gets torn in half. And <laughs> but I mean, the important thing here is, is you, you know, when you're doing something like a project that needs a lot of reference or study or detail, it's sometimes easy to miss the point. And as great a job as Nikki did, and as, one, as wonderful a texture painter she was, sometimes you have to think, well, who's going to watch this? And do we really need to? It's not about grossing people out. We wanted to maximize the violence on the moon. So when this creature slams people, it's not just, he's not just killing him, he's utterly obliterating them. Because that's the point. You need to be afraid of this monster instantly. There's no guesswork. You can't pull your punches. You have to know exactly where you stand. Because at the end of the film, when you see the guy hiding behind the rock, you have to know it's all at stake. Yeah. So that's why we set it up like that in the beginning. That's why it works so well. Is that if, if he's found, he's dead. Okay. Um, but we also wanted to reach out to everybody, so we didn't want to make it as you know a gross over 18s horrible thing. So it still feels very very violent, but you don't really see anything all that nasty. And we were very careful about that. Um, staging. Um, I've recently found some reference. This is from Transformers. Is it the first one? First Transformers. What we loved about this was uh, the motion feels, you know, the slow motion sort of represents the guys on the moon. <coughs> the amount of dirt that's kicked up, the monster never really even fits in the frame. It's, you know, it's, it feels like the cameraman doesn't have time to adjust his framing, which is sort of realistic. We felt like that was kind of realistic. It had an epic kind of quality to it. And, uh, and also all of the, you know, uh, particulates that get kicked up into the air. Uh, and it felt exciting, so we thought this is this is the way we want we want our shots to feel like this. Um, it's also good to get reference together to show people, so everybody understands what the visual goals are when you're making a film like this. This is a very early test that Alvise put together, and it was a good exploration. But then, as we started to develop the suit, we realized this is not the way to go. Um, we started to reference real footage of astronauts on the moon, and they have no flexibility in that suit at all. It's uh, lots of metal pieces that connect the globe to the upper arm and so forth. So they actually kind of run like this, you know, they kind of hop. And we decided, let's go in that direction, because it kind of looks funny, and it plays to the limitations of the actual suit. So even though we set out to do this, we kind of pull back on the range of motion on the character. The monster design was kind of the, the, I thought for me, it was the most fun part. Um, Alvise and I and JD all had a say in, in how we pushed the creature design forward. Um, and what was great about it was we, we would um, work in different packages. Uh, Alvise worked in ZBrush, and I'd worked in the Sculptress, and, uh, and we passed both designs back and forth and, and, and <coughs> until ultimately we came up with the design. The um, early inspiration came from this piece of art, which is uh, a design by Carlos Fuente, who you might have heard of, very famous ILM creature designer. And uh, we couldn't use his design for obvious reasons, for commercial reasons, but we were inspired by the proportions, the small legs, big, strong body, um, big hands, small head, which I felt was kind of key because you did, we're not trying to create a, uh, an in intellectual creature or a smart creature, so the small head and small face kind of said, this is a simple thing. Uh, and the reason that's important is because he's only got one purpose, to kill anyone that's on the moon. So that was it. So I think, I think this design was a really good place to start. Um, from that, we started sketching. This is an early design. No genitals. <laughs> I learned that from Disney. We never put genitals on animals. It was just too many awkward questions. Um, what we loved about this was the 
you know, the power in the upper body. And we needed that to show that he could smash creatures. We wanted a big, scary mouth. So when, when he had that classic movie moment where he roars, that you'd, you'd kind of go, holy crap. And uh, yes, yeah, so there's lots of cool things that we like about this. Here's a close-up. No, stood in a little bit. I'll go to the next one. Um, from that, we started to sort of get a little crazier. So we went bigger with the proportions. More power, larger forearms. We kind of liked some of this. Uh, the mouth got crazier. We dropped teeth for claws. So instead of single teeth, we had little claws that, thinking as animators, we thought when he opens his mouth and roars, you'd also see this going on as well. Which we thought, okay, it makes no sense biologically, but it looks cool. We hadn't really settled on whether it was an insect type or a, or a you know, meat and potatoes type creature that looks like a bull. We didn't really have a preference at the time. And then we started leaning more towards the insects and we added um, some more stuff. This is kind of a neat idea where we, we figured when it comes up first, the face and mouth would appear small. But as it roars, if it had extra appendages that came out like this and made its mouth bigger, that roar would have a much bigger impact. And that's the only reason we put it in there. It makes no other biological sense at all. And I think this is the, the creature as it is in the film. So you can see it's ended up being a kind of mixture of um, there you go. It's a mixture of all of the designs that you saw beforehand. Uh, we went away from very defined muscles and added sort of rolls of fat because we thought as he's running towards you, in order to sell the mass of the creature, he would jiggle and his muscles would bounce around a little bit. So we loosened him up a little bit. I think we, we kept referencing uh, Clint Eastwood as he is today for the belly. I don't know if you've seen the movies. It's pretty nasty. Um, or was it me? Was it me? It was a picture of me, wasn't it? In my bathing suit. Um, yeah, so we're, again, thinking, thinking as animators, we're looking for opportunities to add jiggle or things, masses that can move around and sell the weight. He started to get quite hard in the forearms, and his claws looked quite stiff, so opportunities for secondary animation became more limited at that point. Okay, this is the lit render of the creature in motion. If you watch his belly, you can see it jiggle around. There you go. As we mentioned earlier, the mouth design was kind of important. This is sort of an early, very early um, test as a proof of concept. Oh, it didn't work. Here we go. Uh, we took that concept into uh, uh, JD's world, uh, Jean David, who created a couple of pieces of art where you could see the mouth open and then close again. So we felt like that was a big sort of, would have a big effect. It would look much bigger than it needed to be. But again, it made no anatomical or biological sense whatsoever, but just looked kind of cool. This is what happens when you let animators make films. There's a, a, a quote from Joss Whedon. Uh, he says, make it dark, make it grim, make it tough, but then for the love of God, tell a joke. And that's sort of, that, that's his method. I mean, this is the guy that created Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And um, didn't he do the Avengers? He did the Avengers, the first one, right? Yeah, and he's well known for uh, you know, putting extreme horror and tension right up against jokes and gags. And, you know, he, he's a master at, at understanding that in order to keep people at a peak, you have to let them get anxious and then let some steam off, and then let them come up again and then let some steam off. So this whole film is one big gag. And we always knew what the ending was going to be. So we needed to make sure that the front end was as intense as we could possibly make it, both in terms of what you saw, the violence, the sound, we knew the sound very early on had to be really big, loud, bombastic, to just slam you to the back of your seat instantly. Um, but 
we knew the gag was what it was all about. Even though we were doing all this cool, sexy stuff, the joke was absolutely the key to it. Um, so I'm going to show you. Uh, I'll be saying animatic. I'll turn the sound off, but you can see the entire movie's in here. And what I love about this is when you're creating an animatic, the whole point of it is not to spend any money. Okay, don't spend too much time or money on it, and and solve your storytelling issues with sketches. There you go. Even without sound, you understand it. So if, if you get it as an audience member and you understand what the movie is at this stage, then you know it's going to work. And the beauty of it is you haven't invested too much time building stuff uh, in CG, texturing it, lighting it, before you know that you have a movie. And you should always know what your ending is. That's really, really important. Um, but what this doesn't solve is camera and how much stuff you really see for CG. So the first thing we, are, we did after this was create the, um, the previs, if you will, the 3D version of the animatic. <coughs> so this is, again, a very early pass. So you can see everything's very low res. The creature's just broken up. He's not skinned properly. But what this told us was, can we tell the story in the right amount of time? What does the camera see? How much stuff do we need to build? How much of the landscape is really necessary in 3D versus matte painting? And how close do we get to these characters? What level of build do we need to take on to make them look good? Because when you do it in traditional, you end up using conceits. You use uh, lines to tell stories that light and shadow can tell in a real movie or that music could possibly tell. So that's very important, but again, the trick here is to do it as quickly as possible and not do too much, not make too much stuff to see what it is you're going to have to make, make for real. The, um, the stuff we learned, I think this is kind of important because any of you who are thinking about making a short film, we learned a lot, I learned a lot particularly in doing this. Um, even though you know we worked at Disney where we made films from the start to the end, doing a short is a different, a different beast uh, to undertake. But I thought I'd share that with you because I think it's, it's important to um, uh, talk about the philosophical sort of approach. First thing is, don't ever start a film unless you know what the ending is. Um, I've had lots of people come to me and say, you know, what about the next one? Are you going to do another film? And I go, yes, we're going to do one every year if we can, no matter what. And they say, well, I have an idea. And I go ahead. So I'm trying to have my coffee in the elevator and people are pitching me their movies. And they go, and they pitch it, but they don't know what the ending is yet. Guy walks into a bar. I'm like, great. Then what? Don't know yet. Okay. But he's got big horns. He's got one eye in the center of his head, and he can fly like a bird. I'm like, great. But where's it gonna go? If you don't know what the ending is, don't even start the thing, because um, the ending gives you something to aim at. Okay. So there was a point in this film where everybody was contributing, which can be a, a really good thing, but can be distracting as well. And at the start, of, um, towards the end, you'll notice uh, each of the astronauts has a flag on the shoulder. And the one who's, who's close to the camera, who gets away and farts, he's got an Italian flag because the director's Italian. And it was in honor of Alvise. And we all thought, great idea, stick it in there. And it, it, lots of people are talking about it online. Oh, he's, he's Mexican or he's whatever. People don't <laughs> see him. Anyways, but we put it in for ourselves. And so a lot of people are throwing in ideas like this. Oh, what if we could do this? What if we could do that? And then somebody said, what if we change the flag that they plant on the moon to be an Italian flag or an Irish flag or whatever? I'm like, no, absolutely not. Um, it's a cute idea, but within the first four seconds, you have to know where you are in this movie. That's it. Four astronauts talking, they plant the flag. And what are we all familiar with visually? An American flag. There may be other flags up there, that's the only one we're all familiar with. So I have to get you, I have to give you the context to make this film work within four seconds of this film. So you cannot change that, it can't be any other flag. Or people go, hang on a minute, and then they, they're, they're, be, they're left behind when the story starts. So it's important to know, and, and the reason that I was able to, you know, we're able to make that call was you knew what the ending was, and the journey there was like set up four seconds, turn it on its head, for 20 seconds, pause, and make the joke. That's really what this film is. But if you don't get the context right, you lose some of your audience along the way. They might still laugh at the end, they might not. 
but that was really important. But having the ending gave us all a clear vision of where we needed to go. And any time it started to go left or right of that plan, we were able to pull it back. And because if it didn't work as a joke, it wouldn't work as a film. Understand what works about the idea. So we, we laughed at the animatic, and we knew straight away it's about the fart, and it's all about the setup to that, and make, making people uh, not see it coming. That was, the, that was the gag. I knew, obviously knew, that if we put lots of production value on the front end, you wouldn't see such a low-end joke at the end coming. Right? It's bottom drawer funny, and everybody feels guilty for laughing but everybody laughs, right? <laughs> and that's the key. And we thought, okay, we'll, we'll take it somewhere completely unexpected. So we just ramped up all the production value at the front end and the payoff works because of that. And we knew that and we hung on to that idea. Let's see what the next one is. Keep a project to a reasonable length. We did this in between <coughs> other projects. Um, I think we were finishing Edge of Tomorrow and starting on a couple of other things. And we sort of fit it in uh, around that. And the first thing that happens on any short film is, you know, the ideas expand. It never gets short. It always gets, oh, we could do this. Oh, we could have that. Oh, we could add an extra shot. And my job then became to say, no, no, we're going to keep it in this box. And what was great about this project um, was the fact that it's a fake commercial, which and all commercials are about 30 seconds long. So as soon as it started to grow past that, I could say, no, it doesn't feel like a commercial anymore, so we could keep it back in the box. And what that did was it focused us on telling the story really, really as leanly as possible. Yeah, so every time something had to happen, we just went really maximum with it. So when he kills the astronauts, he utterly destroys them. Uh, when he roars, it's the big, biggest roar we can get. We maximized how that looked. Um, but keeping it to a reasonable length meant we actually got it finished on time as well. And it's, it's something to bear in mind. If you're at a studio and you want to do this type of thing, it's really important that you get actually get it done or you may not get a chance to do it again. Encourage creativity, input, and ownership. Everybody that was on the team could have a say. You have to manage that. As we mentioned earlier on, it, people can get carried away and lose sight of what the goal is with the project. And your job as a leader on that is to sort of keep everybody up to speed with what the goals are and what the, what the story is. Um, but you really do want to get people to feel like they have input on it. And w what I learned um, at Disney, um, I did a job, I think it was Rain of Fire, it was one of the first visual effects projects I did at Disney, strangely. Um, and I remember there was a scene that, where a dragon flies in, it's the land on a castle, and the animator did a pass, and I wasn't happy. And I wasn't happy because she didn't she animate it the way I would have animated it. But it looked okay, it looked fine, but it wasn't the way I would have done it. So I kept making her redo it, and redo it, and redo it. And it took three, four times longer. And when I saw it in, in the movies, in the cinema, like, a few months later, I thought, you know what? Her version was just as good. It would have worked fine, and I just pissed her off by sitting in the back seat and telling her, no, 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 drive like this, drive like this, rather than saying, just take me here, and you drive the car any way you want. Um, so she didn't enjoy that phase. And I learned, I learned my lesson on that. So the way I supervise now, and the way I encourage other people to lead and supervise, is to let the artist be artistic and have input. Um, has everybody seen Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah, you've all seen it. Yeah. Uh, how many people have read the book? A few people. And is the movie as good as the book? Never, right? It's never as good as the book. Uh, I never read the book. I went to see the movie with my mate, my buddy, who was a big fan. And I came in, I was like, that was awesome, that was amazing. And he was like, that sucked. And I'm like, how can we be so far apart on that? And it was because he'd read it. And when you read a book, which is just words, you make the pictures in your head. So you work for that. You create that in your head. That's an artistic thing that you, everybody does. You create it. When you create it, you own it. It's yours. And nobody else will beat that. Nobody in your head. And what you have to do is let people read the book. Right? You have to let, when they do the work for you, you have to let them be creative. Because if they, if they don't get the opportunity, they won't enjoy the process. And if they don't enjoy it, they won't give as much. 
So ownership, I think, is really, really important when you're working with animators in particular, or with anybody, is to let them have a say and then guide them towards the goal without picking up the brush yourself and painting it for them. Um, it's the one thing I learned in 25 years in this business. Um, the other thing I've also learned is when you want to get something done, ask somebody who's really busy. Uh, it sounds crazy, but people who are have their plates full of work could go, yeah, I'll move this aside, I'll do this, and then I'll move it on, and it would be awesome. Because their wheels are turning, right? And they're, they're not overthinking, they're already in the zone. If you get somebody who's not that busy, it just takes a lot longer. It'll probably still look good, but it always takes a lot longer. <coughs> just throwing it out there. But I, I learned that on this movie in particular. Keep it within the reach of the team, technically and artistically. So every team you work with is different. Sometimes you're very lucky to get amazing people. On this show, we had very amazing people. But you push them enough that they reach, but it has to be grabbable. If you're asking people to do something that's not achievable, it's gonna get frustrating, and they're gonna lose confidence, and you will lose confidence in them as a supervisor. On this team, we were very lucky, but I think that's a key thing for me, is judge your team's abilities, and just go, you know, let's reach for here, because we, you know, everybody will get something out of it in that, in that case. It's a difficult thing to judge, but I think it's important. Make a schedule, which was my job on this one, and then try to stick to it. We didn't stick to it at all. Um, because we're fitting this project in around other projects, but if you don't try to stick to it, it will slow down. It, everything will take a lot longer. People need goals. And what would happen week to week was somebody would get really close to finishing the astronaut, for example. So we'd go, we're gonna finish the astronaut this Friday. Now we could have kept working on it, but you need those milestones because it feels like you're getting one hand onto the next rock and pulling yourself up. Okay, if you don't have that feeling in the crew, you never feel like you're getting to the finish line. It's really important for everyone psychologically to know that they're getting there. So just try to remember that if you are trying to get something done. Um, keep the faith and remember what worked the first time and stick to it. The longer something takes, especially if it's funny, the less funny it gets. Right? Uh, when I was at Disney, we would work on film, put lots of jokes and gags in. And after three months, it's still funny. After six months, you start to think, I didn't laugh at that, that last time. After a year, that joke's out, and they'll put another joke in. The thing is, it worked the first time. You have to keep the faith and go, it worked. We're just seeing it over and over and over again. And yes, it becomes less fresh, but it worked the first time, and that's what keeping the faith means. If it worked and it was strong, put underline it and go, we're not changing that, and stick to it. If the temptation is, the longer your schedule is, the more you'll want to go back and change that stuff that worked perfectly fine the first time through. So we, we, we had a few moments, I think, in this where we were like, uh, not sure. And then we kind of went, no, 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 it worked. Remember when we showed it to so-and-so? Or, or we would screen it for somebody who hadn't seen it before, uh, which is also really important. Show it to keep it fresh. Show it to people who haven't seen it before. Um, and engage their reaction and trust that. You know? So it was all, we always got to laugh. And it always worked. So the other things that we changed um, as we went, but that never changed from the beginning. So we're actually close to 10 million views on YouTube uh, since its release. It released, it reached 1 million within a week, I think. Was it a week? It was a week. And we were on the phone. It was, uh, it was so exciting. Um, and then it went, you know, crazy. Uh, we got awarded, some ad magazine said, the best ad ever for a product that doesn't exist. <laughs> so I don't know if that's, is that good? That's good, right? Um, but it was really exciting to see that you know we made something that, because we made it for ourselves and for an audience, not just our peers, not just you guys, and not just people in the business. Um, although that was important to us. We wanted like our friends, our family, the public to enjoy it. That was always sort of the thing. Um, but at the same time, we want to kind of flex our, our muscles a little bit and show people what we could do. Um, but, you know, when you, when you do that, you get some interesting kind of feedback. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we, if you go onto YouTube and read the comments, it's great, actually. Uh, this guy said, uh, besides the fact I just watched three people brutally murdered, this was a funny commercial. And that, I think that's a good thing. I think we did it. That's a good thing. Um, this one, 
is interesting. Uh, he said, uh, if you look closely, the flag on the Bean astronaut shoulder doesn't match the other astronauts' flags. Considering the fact they're only placing one flag, the Bean astronaut is likely from another spacecraft. <laughs> this tells us that the Bean astronaut, I, I can't believe he even spent so long typing this, um, may have been secretly observing the astronauts after coming from another base. It's important to pay attention to detail, even in commercials, we get another story than the obvious one presented. <laughs> this is obviously the guy that stops the DVD and watches yeah. the... And on right underneath it, this guy's saying, whoa, dude, I have a party on Saturday and you must come. You must be fun at parties. <laughs> the biggest objection, the biggest sort of problem anybody had, with all this crazy stuff he did, first of all, the monster's pink. And we argued about this, even right until the end, we weren't sure, the beginning was kind of brown, we went blue for a while, then to red. Uh, Richard, who is the CG soup, he found this image of a crab, a uh, real crab on a really black piece of rock. And the red was just intense, it was just really popped. And he's like, that's real. And I'm like, okay, so we tried it. We stuck it in, we made it red. We were just never sure about it. And towards the end, we kind of got comfortable with it, I think is where it ended up. Um, but we kind of liked it because red means danger, and it's you know, it, and it just it, you saw it when you saw it, you couldn't take your eyes off it, so we stuck to our guns. Uh, and this thing with the with the face, we thought people would talk about that. Biggest objection: this video makes no sense. There's no sound in space. <laughs> the number one thing, since there's no air in the moon, the fart wouldn't be heard by the monster. <laughs> Even if this did happen, sound can't travel through a vacuum. It needs a medium so the monster couldn't have heard it. Seriously? <laughs> You're not bothered with the fact there's a monster on the moon? <laughs> <laughs> Astronaut is standing on ground, which can vibrate so alien could hear it through its feet. Elephants do so. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but it makes me want to Google it for sure. So, it, you know, I'm going to finish with Terry Pratchett's uh, quote, stories of imagination tend to upset those without one, is, is pretty clear from YouTube. And initially when we started reading all this, which I took as negative initially, I thought I oh, got a little bit freaked out by it. And uh, not upset per se, but kind of worried me. And, and then I thought, well, wait a minute, it caused a reaction enough that people would type about it. And I think that's cool. That is cool, because they secretly, they probably liked it, and secretly, I think they laughed at the fart. <laughs> and I got them with that. So, so th after a while I thought, you know what, that's, maybe that's what entertainment is. Maybe when you put something out, you have to let it live and stand on its own two feet. And that's what we did with this film. Um, we had a great time doing it. Uh, I'm gonna finish with a making of video and then take some questions.
So I guess besides being a very entertaining uh, presentation, I think it was actually a mini master class on uh, production, really, like CG production. It went through every single step, explained fairly well, I think. There's a reason behind pretty much every aspect of this short film. And, uh, well, any questions? The director, ladies and the gentlemen. The director and animator, I think, right? <laughs> Not a bit in space. Yeah, I know someone wants to ask us that question. <laughs> Come on, one question at the back. Is just a silly question. You never pitched this ad to the commercial, the Heinz brand? An agency called BBH, very famous agency, looked into doing it, and uh, it didn't go very far. I don't think Heinz Beans would want to advertise what they consider the downside of their product to be. Um, but we did try it, um, but it was never our intention to sell it as a Heinz commercial, right? It was, um, it was just for us. We did it for ourselves. So we never, we, we haven't monetized it on YouTube, we haven't done any of that. We just wanted to put it out for what it was and see. I mean, we didn't even try to manipulate uh, the YouTube numbers, which you can do, apparently. I've learned, I've learned that now. Um, uh, we can do anything on Google, which is release it and see what happens. Um, and it just took off, and it's been really a really positive thing. We've had lots of people calling us about it. Yeah, you get a lot of interest, right? Right. Um, <laughs> I wasn't listening to the, the question, so... Uh, What we have done, um, you may not know about this, uh, <laughs> is I, we got called uh, from a company in, uh, in America who have a chain of cinemas. And they said, oh, we really like it, but can you change the fart to a ringtone? <laughs> and we thought, genius, what a great idea. So we did that. And we're yeah, yeah, yeah. It's better than your film. Uh, no. um, so it, it's going to show up in galaxy theaters, which are like a small family chain in Texas. So the, guy, the phone rings, the monster hears him, and instead of it being a Heinz tin thing, it says, please turn off your mobile phones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not making any money off it, but it gets exposure. It's out there, and people will enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I was going to ask you, how, uh, how long did it take you to make this short film, or how many people were working on it? How long? How long did you start? I, I, I uh, yeah, uh, it took pretty much uh, five months, six, five months, and we were, we started me and uh, Eamon. So I uh, working on the model design, and then uh, slowly other people came in, and at the peak of the production we were 18, 19, 19 people, pretty much. Uh, yeah. So what Farid is telling you is he animated it. And all the way through, uh, and then uh, towards the end, because it's one big scene, um, we had a little a cleanup pass that needed to be done, you know, interpenetrations and so forth and the astronauts. So animators who became free took one astronaut each for a few days, and we ended up giving them a credit, but LVC really did most of the work. Anyone else? No? Oh, there you go. Very good. I mean, lots of people in the industry mailed us and went, wow, this is awesome. So we made our friends in the community sit up and take notice, and they enjoyed it. Um, but equally, we've had lots of people come to us to say, we'd like you to bid on the show, this creature work. Um, and I think it takes a while. I think it can take a year before you really get all that feedback through. But it's definitely been very good. Um, 
both for us as a company and as, as artists as well. Did you have anything to add? No. That's good. He doesn't want this thing. Come on, one more. Anyone? How do I pull this thing off? It's a lot of work. Yes, I did, uh, but it was something that I was going to talk about uh, later uh, on my lecture. That's why I'm not going to talk uh, now, about, even if I'm not going to talk about beans, I'm going to talk about uh, animation and uh, what it means to work in big companies, etc., etc. But I will finish talking a little bit of uh, what something like this can uh, bring you in to your life. So, yeah, I got yeah some... Uh, Interest, interesting feedback. I'll talk about it later. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much.